Today, we're going to talk about post-concussion syndrome and inflammation. I am Dr. Martin Rutherford, certified functional medicine practitioner, uh, chiropractor. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractor. And uh, I'm also a concussion sufferer uh, from more concussions than I can possibly <laughs> tell you. So, so I've had a lot of experience on both sides of, of the track on this one. So this is going to be kind of like the beginning of some fun stuff for me, because I think that we have a pretty good understanding of concussion here uh, relative to the kind of results that we're getting. Concussion, it seems to be coming in our door a lot right now, and it's getting a lot more attention. Today is gonna to be on inflammation. Just to let you know, we're aware of the controversies out there relative to, or, or different conflicting or competing theories, maybe would be a better way of putting it. Um, is it the neck, is it the whiplash? Is it an upper cervical uh, problem? Is it, uh, is it the post-traumatic stress syndrome that frequently will uh, accompany these types of things? And in this presentation and over the next couple of weeks, we will address all of those, what we understand, what's in the research, what we see correlates with the research, and, and, and give you a good idea. If you have post-concussion syndrome, you've had a concussion, you know, six months, a year, two years ago, and you're still feeling it, you're still having symptoms from it that you didn't have before, this is going to be, this is going to be valuable information for you. This is, this is the data that, that Dr. Gates uses when he's navigating through these cases. So um, concussion and inflammation, I, I'd like to say that my brain keeps getting better. And I had serious concussions, serious, I won't go into the whole thing, but serious concussions to the point where I had one, <coughs> where I basically almost didn't know who I was well, I didn't know on certain days who I was over a period of about six months. And um, lost skills, some that I've never gotten back, and, and was kind of struggling even when Dr. Gates and I met. And that was eight years ago now. Yeah? Is that eight years ago? Wow. So it was about eight years ago. And, 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 I, and, and so uh, it's amazing. I was just thinking this morning, not knowing, this is before you dinged me that this is what we were doing. And I was just thinking, God, my brain keeps getting better and better and better and better. It's pretty cool. So, so uh, I've had 11 concussions that are kind of notable that actually fit the concussion loss consciousness, kind of didn't know where I was, those types of things. So, so it's been interesting for me to be on the other side of this and watch how this area has developed since the NFL uh, thing came out. So today it's going to be, I think what we, what you see mostly out there, what we see mostly relative to what, what is what is a concussion? What 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 and 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 do you do you have to be knocked out to have a concussion? And then, but what's the real what is the real probable cause that is causing you to have symptoms going on sometimes for years after having a concussion? Symptoms that you did not have before that concussion. So there's not going to be a long uh, presentation because we're going to be cutting this up into several. Uh, uh, presentation. Plus next week, we're doing a no BS series, which is where we go into great length. It's sometimes they're an hour, hour and 10 minutes or more sometimes on all the aspects of concussion causes, competing theories and, and uh, general treatment as to how you would go about getting this under control. So concussion, post-concussion syndrome, which has a very specific meaning to me anyway, mm -hmm. post-concussion syndrome and inflammation. Person gets whacked, they go to the hospital, and whatever, it's a horse hitting them in the head, or it's a car, we live in horse country here in Reno, Nevada, <laughs> so we see that. Or whether it's a, uh, you know, a car accident, or somebody punched you, or you hit your head Some on it. Something fell on your head by accident. Or, oh yeah we, had, too. yeah, we had a lady the other yeah. day who she put her head under the hood of the car and the hood fell down and so on and so forth. So whether, and then all of a sudden things change. Walk us through this. So just in summary, you can go back and watch our other broadcasts on this. We've done a litany of them. Just in quick summary of our recent broadcasts. In the concussion world, lots of times, there's an element of culpability. So somebody hits, gets their head hit, and their life forever changes. Most people who get their head hit may have a concussion, and they come out of it. And this but is a key point. There's a certain percentage Some of you don't. who will not come out of it. If you've had other head injuries in the past, other concussions, you're more likely to develop post-concussion syndrome, but not always. And it's throughout the literature, some people get hit on the head once, they're in a car accident once, and then forever their life changes. 
So then it becomes there's a burden of proof frequently. And so you just have to. If you're to on a whiplash, that. you know, if you're on a right. whiplash, suddenly your you head know. didn't hit the windshield, your head didn't hit anything, and you got all these concussion syndromes, now you're a loss, sir. Yeah, you're walking through somebody's yard, a tree branch falls on your head. This is what we see. This and is the reality are, of it. Yeah, and people so are going to make an effort to, to say that you're faking it. Right. And so there's this element now in the literature to try and say, okay, is there something real going on? And more importantly, aside from the burden of proof or culpability or all of that, we're from the standpoint where we want to fix people. We want to get people better. That's our role. We also want you to understand kind of what's going on too. And so in understanding how to get people better, the current literature has shown the patients who have concussions, repeated brain injuries, things of that nature, their blood brain barrier can break down. You know, there's evidence of this. You also have to realize that you can find evidence saying that that's not the case long term. But there is... You might want to define blood brain barrier. Blood brain barrier is your blood vessels that go into your brain. Think of your carotid artery goes into many smaller arteries. Think of like trees with their branches. That kind of same phenomena happens in your brain with blood vessels. And as you get down to the small, small, small blood vessels, they should be like a PVC pipe. Basically, they should be have a tight wall. Only little tiny molecules should be able to get through that wall so your brain can get things like glucose and oxygen and other metabolites. If that blood brain barrier breaks down, it becomes like Swiss cheese. And then so lots of big molecules can get into your brain. Inflammatory molecules, think of them that way. Molecules that don't belong there. That don't belong there. Immune system, antibodies, things of that nature can get into the brain. So that's been demonstrated in the literature. They've looked at college football athletes, pre-game, post-game, no concussions, but just hitting their head and they see that all of a sudden their immune system, which should be located in their body. You have a separate immune system in your body from the one in your brain. All of a sudden their immune system from their body is like trafficking into their brain to heal the inflammation. So the question becomes, why do you, depending on the statistics, 85% to 94% of people who get a concussion have no residual symptoms, but 6 to 15% develop post-concussion syndrome. And we know that when somebody hits their head, for example, their stress hormones can go up 2 to 300%, their adrenaline levels. We know that their hormones sometimes, like their testosterone or their estrogen or their thyroid hormones or their adrenal hormones, think of things like cortisol can become blunted. And it may not show up for quite some time because the pituitary gland, which is like a grape, and it sits in a cup, when your brain up here shakes in a head injury, that pituitary can get stretched and may not function correctly and secrete the right hormones and or uh, signaling hormones, things of that nature. So we know all of those things. We know that the gastrointestinal barrier, there's evidence that your intestines can start to break down and become like Swiss cheese, and that can create inflammation. So that's the current model on concussion. And just in summary, in the weeks prior, we talked about imaging findings because all of you are looking for, well, my brain scan was normal. Is there maybe going to be a new brain scan on the horizon? And researchers are working towards that. But it's still kind of like herding cats because there are many different ways to image the brain. You can use CT scan. You can use different types of MRI scans. You can use SPECT scans. You can use functional MRI scans. There's all these different things, diffusion tensor imaging. And so researchers are trying to figure out, okay, what's the one method that will say, okay, this was a concussion, this wasn't a concussion. And then they're looking for blood tests. We talked about that last week. What constitutes a concussion? And really they're looking for these blood tests, the researchers, because they're trying to show to an insurance company, okay, well, if we can identify out of 100 patients, 85 patients who don't need a CT scan, we're gonna save the insurance companies a lot of money. So that's the impetus for it. But the good part for you is that if we find the blood test, it's gonna say, okay, you had a definitive neurological injury. That's positive. Then there's a question, without rambling too long, getting to the inflammation, there's a question of, well, maybe was this individual who had a concussion and developed post-concussion syndrome, maybe were they a compromised host? We could mm -hmm. talk about that frequently. Maybe there was something going on before you had this concussion. Maybe you were already in somewhat of an inflamed state and you didn't even know it. And I'm not saying you have to be obese or diabetic for this to happen. Maybe you're already inflamed and then that predisposed you to the concussion. Or, you could use me. I mean, I was chronically stressed and I had celiac. Right, and then you had the concussion. And then I had my mm -hmm. first big concussion in high school and it was it changed my whole personality, changed my ability to do mathematics. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In addition to the other one that changed my ability to do math. 
And it's very interesting because a lot of, their one struggle in the concussion literature is that it's hard to do like a randomized control, control clinical trial double blinded with concussion because how are you going to do that where you're going to punch somebody in the head and then open their brain up and look at what's going on. A lot of the studies on humans have to be post-mortem or we have to look at what's going on with blood markers, blood tests, so to speak. Whereas the animal model facilitates this much easier where they can take a mouse, we're not trying to be graphic, we understand you know, animal rights and all those things, but they take a mouse, they hit them in the head, they look for their symptoms, they see how the mouse like interacts with other mice, they see how it swims through a little maze, these are documented tests that objectively show if like a mouse is depressed or if they're confused or how their cognitive functioning is, is working and they can say, okay, there's a problem here and then they open up their brain and they can see, okay, there's a lot of inflammation. So what we are seeing, the reason why we're talking about this today, because there's mounting evidence that those who suffer with post-concussion syndrome have cytokine problems. You have immune inflammation problems. And there's research, we attach research articles to the broadcast. You can find those on powerhealthtalk.com. You're not gonna find them on YouTube. Search uh, concussion and inflammation. And you want to scroll down to the article that has post-inflammatory brain syndrome in it because it's an excellent review and how maybe we need to relook at post-concussion syndrome and look at it as a post-inflammatory brain syndrome because there's a lot of overlap between post-concussion syndrome and other inflammatory brain states. For example, if you're really sick or you come out of surgery, we see a lot of patients who come out of surgery, there's a lot of inflammation associated with surgery. Plus, you're under anesthesia, and they see that, that all that inflammation in the brain can affect people. It can affect how they think. It can affect their cognition. They feel confused. They may have headaches. See, that's the struggle in the scientific world because all the symptoms I just labeled off for you, which many of yeah. you are suffering from, you're going to see that in patients who just got in a car wreck and didn't hit their head. And the reason that happens in surgery or a car wreck is your, your brain doesn't know that you're not, you know, your, your brain says I'm being attacked, right? You have a surgery. I'm being attacked. So your stress hormones go up two to 300% and then those stress hormones cause mm -hmm. inflammation, right? Minus even just the, uh, the neurotrauma effects. And then that causes very similar effects, very similar it. symptoms. So we have to look at this as an, um, an inflammatory brain syndrome. Yeah. And yes, are there problems in the head from the head injury? Absolutely. We know that they're one of the newest ways to test if there's going to be a head injury. One of the more promising ways is looking at RNA profiles. So it looks at how your, your brain cells are producing certain proteins, basically. And they're saying that this may be the way to tell if somebody has a neurological injury. But yeah. even minus that, everything I laid out before this and Dr. Rutherford laid out is showing you that with the head injury, stress hormones go up. Maybe the gut breaks down, the blood brain barrier breaks down, and now you're in this potential. Think of the Swiss cheese state now, where the barriers are open for inflammation to start in the body. Yeah, and now these for me, chronic the, inflammatory states. The stuff from my celiac or my gut finds its way to the brain. The stress hormones much easier now. Much easier. The, the stress hormones are already there, and and now you're a compromised host. Now you get whacked. Now your blood brain barrier breaks down. Now all that crap either ex explodes here or inflammation from here and other places. At that point, if you have high or low blood sugar, if you have things like that, high blood sugar, when you have like a reaction to high blood sugar, you eat, you know, or if you have low blood sugar and you get irritable and shaky, that creates inflammation. Anything that creates inflammation down here now finds its way up there. That's post-concussion. Right, and that's where once these inflammatory cascades get started, think of like, I hate saying like, think of when you have a cold or a flu. How do you feel mentally? You probably don't think as quickly. You probably feel a little depressed. You feel a little sluggish, a little confused, a little brain foggy. Well, that, as many of you know, who have post-concussion syndrome, that's kind of what you're experiencing all the time. And now they're able to track through blood testing these inflammatory immune messengers. Think of the military. In the military, you have your main branches, right? And then you have big generals who then tell you know, the colonels and the lieutenant colonels and then the sergeant, on and on and on, down the line. So down here you have the troops, and these troops are like messengers. This guy's saying, okay, let's go over here. This guy's saying, let's go over here. Well, your immune system is very much the same way. So when people are in chronically inflammatory syndromes or states, then you have a lot of inflammatory messengers. And that's what we're able to track 
with this inflammatory brain syndrome condition. And this article is fantastic because they're coalescing the literature showing that with post-concussion syndrome, these are the inflammatory markers that we're seeing versus patients who have headaches or sickness behavior or post-surgical uh, syndrome states. They have maybe overlapping markers, but not all the same ones as post-concussion syndrome. So I think this is an exciting realm for the future of post-concussion literature. And I think it's probably gonna be what you see in the next 10 to 15 years. We talk about that often. We're trying to give you the newest information so you know what's going on. Because frankly, there wasn't a lot of information before the whole concussion NFL um, epiphany, so to speak, where everybody started saying, okay, there's something going on here. Is that too long? <laughs> no, that, that was short for, for us. <laughs> no, I think that's it because you can look at our other presentations and it covers a lot of these uh, different areas of different topic areas that Dr. Gage has covered in greater detail. Then we're going to fill in some of the new things over the next couple of weeks and then we're going to do this whole presentation on concussion. We've done them on other things, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and Lyme disease and so that's where somebody really wants to know the whole story and is willing to sit down and watch for an hour and 10 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes can really see how it's all put together. So, uh, so if you're interested that that's all floating around our, our website. So yeah, and no, I wanna, that's great. Okay. I want to inject just a couple more things. So one really cool study they did on mice is they took mice and with concussion that they induced or no concussion. And then they either gave, the mice with concussion, saline, so basically they just put in like sodium chloride and fluid, it's just salt water into their veins, salt water. <laughs> or they put in, <laughs> or they put in what's termed lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides are pieces of gram-negative bacteria that are highly inflammatory. And again, we said that the gut can break down with concussion, and when the gut breaks down, you can absorb more lipopolysaccharides, LPS as it's termed. Into your bloodstream. Into your bloodstream. And so they found that the when they injected lipopolysaccharide into the mice who had a concussion, there was a completely different response than injecting lipopolysaccharide into the mice who didn't have a concussion. So it's again, more evidence that there's this propensity for inflammation. It's just like igniting, you know, whatever. It's igniting the inflammatory cascades in a concussion patient. They're also even now tracking high sensitive C-reactive protein in concussion patients. I'm looking for a difference, but you can go and read that research article. It's kind of a tighter criteria for understanding this issue versus the normal criteria used in clinical practice. But they are seeing that there's a correlation between cognitive symptoms and affective symptoms, so like depression and anxiety, with the high sensitive C-reactive protein. It didn't correlate as much with dizziness. So this is the new information. This yeah. is what we got. Every patient we've seen, almost every patient we've seen now who has concussions, post-concussion syndrome, should say more specifically, post-concussion mm -hmm, syndrome mm -hmm. seems to have autoimmune responses to their thyroid. We see high signs of inflammation a lot of time, and we pick up hormonal disturbances frequently. So that's it. That's the data. Yeah, and and so and and so just for those of you who might be interested, in the end, you you have to rehab the brain in certain in a certain fashion with brain rehab exercises to strengthen the area that has been weakened by the hip. But in the end, it's finding the inflammation and figuring out how to get rid of it. And it's not noni juice and it's not CBD oil. <laughs> it's, it's, there, it's a little deeper than that. And, uh, and so that's kind of, and we discussed that in some of our other, other uh, presentations and we, we'll discuss it in that uh, uh, no BS series on concussion. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.